I teach philosophy at Vassar College. I was a Princeton PhD. And about three years ago, I decided to start a storytelling podcast about philosophy. The thing that I was looking for were stories about small corners in American life where philosophical assumptions were beneath the surface. Right? People didn't think about these practices as being the kind of things that you could question. Right? I, I was looking for hidden conflicts, unquestioned assumptions, practices that seemed so much a part of the landscape that it seemed natural. But once we started examining them, we realized, no, there's a lot more there. And once you pull at the string, things start to unravel a little bit. And I'm going to talk to you today about the very first conflict that I found. Uh, I found it surprisingly enough in uh, a place you don't think of as being very interesting, the laws of estate planning. But if you think about it, the laws of estate planning are rife for interesting stories because, first of all, people who do estate planning are the very wealthy. And the very wealthy are, to put it mildly, a little quirky sometimes. And the second thing is that estate planning is really about death. right? And what you're forced to think about when you're forced to think about your own death and what you're going to leave in the world and how you're going to leave that thing in the world. The theme of today's conference is the smallest unit of human connection. And if you think about it, there's supposed to be a moment where that connection is supposed to end. But what I found in the laws of estate planning is that contrary to the, you know, to the appearances, death isn't the moment where the connection between people end. It's actually the most powerful moment where someone can hold on to their connection to the human world forever. And this is a good place to be talking about this here at Princeton. You're actually surrounded by names of dead people, right? They're on buildings. They're on professorships. Entire programs are named after them. And these are all made possible by something called a conditional gift or a conditional bequest. But they're not really gifts, right? You're asking for something in return, right? Upon your death, Princeton is going to get a certain amount of money. And in return for that, you put your name on a building or a park bench or something. Those are pretty benign. But you know, in the law, you find some really quirky stories about this. There was a story about the man in San Antonio in 1993. And when he died, he bequeathed his fortune to his wife, but only on the condition that she smoke five cigarettes a day. Right? Uh, apparently, he was very annoyed that she was pestering him his whole life to quit smoking. There's this other example of, uh, of a man in Washington, DC, who left uh, $500 a month. And let me read the quote here that he wrote in his will. I believe that those who break the law are selfish and arrogant. And to that effect, I leave $500 a month to the police officer who writes the most tickets for double parking, right, every month that he left that. And these kinds of things, as funny as they sound, um, hold up in court, right? Uh, some of them are not very funny. Right. Very recently, Paul Smith College, which is a small vocational college in the Adirondacks, was facing insolvency. And they talked to some of their billionaire donors. And there was a couple, the Wiles, who decided to give $20 million to uh, Paul Smith on the condition that they renamed the school Paul Smith Joan Wile College. The trustees wanted it. The administration wanted it. It would have saved the college. Uh, so what happened? They had to take it to court. The problem was that the original bequest was from Paul Smith, who owned the land that the college was on. And the bequest was, you can operate a college here, you just have to name it after me forever. Right? It's clearly written right, in the will. So the court took one look at that, and they ruled, you can't rename the college. Right? And so today, Paul Smith College uh, is struggling to survive. What I think these cases point out is that sometimes conditional bequests are made that force people to do things that are contrary to the interest of people today. They're forced to execute the wishes of the dead in such a way that living people don't want it, but they feel helpless to do anything about it. So some of these are like, I bequeath money on the condition that my inheritors marry within a certain religion. right? Uh, some of them are things like, here's a university. There are these bequests that all of this money go to a research department that studies paranormal phenomena. Right? This was a big thing in like the 50s and 60s. 
And people don't feel like they can do anything about it, which shows that there's this assumption at work here. The courts are enforcing the wishes of the dead at the cost of the living, and it seems natural, right? Part of the landscape. To see how unnatural it is, think about animals doing this, right? Could you imagine a squirrel dying, and then you standing around looking at the squirrel and saying, what do you think Bob wanted us to do with these nuts, right? Did he want them donated to Princeton? Do I have to marry a Catholic to get them, right? This is not the kind of thing that you will find in nature. Because, right, in nature, once you die, all your rights, responsibilities, but all of your possessions get returned to the natural state. It gets severed, your connections to the living world. You don't get to have any more say in the world. You certainly don't get to compel living people to do something contrary to their interests, right? Um, but what I think this says about us as human beings is that we're not natural creatures. Americans aren't natural creatures. You actually don't find this practice very much in other parts of the world. You find it in Anglo-American law. You find it in America, Britain, Canada, Australia, and so on. So what are the assumptions behind this practice? I got a few more stories that help tease them out. This is Augustus Octavius Bacon. Bacon was a Confederate veteran who was elected to the US Senate and died in 1914. He was from Macon, Georgia, so Macon's Bacon. Augustus Bacon bequeathed when he died acres of his land for the establishment, and here's another quote, for the sole perpetual and unending use, benefit, enjoyment of the white women, white girls, white boys, and white children of Macon. And this is the important part. He said, under no circumstances nor at any time for any reason is the park to be devoted to any other purpose or use. And so it was. For 50 years, there was this beautiful park in Macon, Georgia, called Bacon's Field Park. Of course, you know what happened. 50 years passed, Civil Rights Act, and the Supreme Court ruled that insofar as this was a public park, you couldn't segregate it, right? And so what happened next? Well, if you didn't have any inclination or practice of honoring the wishes of the dead, you would think that the right debate to have at this point is to say, well, what's good for this community? Should we keep this park and you know, integrate it now? I mean, we're kind of forced to by law. Sure, you have a public policy debate about what's good for the living. That's not what happened, right? It's not what happened because you can't do that in the law. In the law, you have to uh, abide by this principle called CYPRE, C-Y-P-R-E-S, uh, which is French for as close as possible, right? Essentially, what the two sides had to debate was whether Bacon, who died 50 years earlier, would have wanted an integrated park or would have wanted no park rather than an integrated park. Right? That's the debate to be. And eventually, the Georgia Supreme Court ruled that it's pretty clear from the statement of the will, no other purpose but a park for white children, right? that he would have wanted no park. Right? This is Bacon's Field Park today. This was upheld by the Supreme Court as well. Right? It's doctrine of sea prey. So what are the assumptions behind a society which has values like this? These are the American practices regarding private property upon death in American law. Right? The priority is, number one, you execute the wishes of the dead to the letter. Right? Number two, if you can't do that, do as close as possible. See what they would have wanted subject to the laws of today. If you can't do that, then you give it to the heirs. And that's what happened in Bacon's case. The heirs took the land and they sold it off. It was good money. Kroger's there. And if you can't do any of that, then it goes to the common good, right? The state coffers, right? The taxpayers. One thing to notice about this is you could easily imagine that things are not this way. In fact, you don't have to imagine it. There are plenty of societies and cultures in which things aren't prioritized this way. You know, you could easily give number three the first priority. The first thing is that the heirs have a say in what, right? And then distant on that list is what the person originally wanted, right? Or you could say, no, you know what? The common good comes first. And the wishes of the dead, say, come second or come third or fourth. What we've chosen in our society are the values where this is the priority. So what does that say? What does it say about our society that this is how we do things now? Well, first, it says that we really value the connection people have with their property, right? We think that even when a human being is literally disconnected from the world, right, they are dead, 
they're still connected to their property. Property rights are eternal, even when human lives are not. And we don't think of other rights this way. You could imagine voting rights, for instance, as being this way. Right now, as soon as you're dead, you don't get to vote anymore. Right? But we could pass a law that says you can write in your will a vote right? that'll be carried out eternally by the society in which you live. It could be for the Democratic candidate. It could be the white separatist candidate. It could be for your pet cause candidate. Right? The government enforces it, and the votes of the dead compete with the living. Right? You could do that. We don't do that. We don't have absentee voting for the really, really absent, which is what that would be. And the reason why we don't do that is because we don't think that the right to political power should survive someone's death. People who don't have a stake in the world shouldn't have any power to influence it. But curiously, we do that with property. Right? So here's a hidden conflict. There are frequent conflicts between the wishes of the dead and those of the living. And we don't treat other rights this way. Where can this go? Well, I'm going to tell two other stories that make what happened in Macon, Georgia seem like good news. So Leonard and Beryl Buck were a wealthy couple who lived in Marin County, California. And they left $10 million in a stock, which is important later. Let me quote, for nonprofit organizations that serve the needy in Marin County. But the problem is, I don't know if anybody here is from Marin. This is Marin County. Right? Marin County is one of the wealthiest places to live in America, which makes it one of the wealthiest places to live in the world. Probably one well-funded nonprofit could serve all of the needy in Marin County. What happened next was uh, they actually left $10 million worth of an oil stock right? that was subsequently, within a couple of years, sold and generated $250 million right, in revenue. Within a decade, it was $450 million. Right? And one of the things that you have when you have uh, property rights reserved for the dead is all the money that's earned originally still belongs to the dead. Now, if you think about it, what does it mean to own anything? Right? It means people respect your wishes as to that thing. Right? That's what it means to own something. Right? Well, people have to respect the wishes of the box, um, even when the endowment went to $450 million. That's an obscene amount of money to be spending on the needy in Marin County. So what happened was the trustees recognized this and went to court and said, look, right, we need to spread this wealth around. We can't just keep the money in Marin County. There are needy people just across the bay or something like that. And the court said, no, it's crystal clear in the will that the money had to stay in Marin. And that's what the ruling was. So now there's $1 billion and growing, and it's going to continue growing because you can't spend that much on the needy in Marin County. So today, the endowment is $1 billion. And $1 billion? is small potatoes compared to the story I'm about to tell you next. So this is the Hershey School in Hershey, Pennsylvania, not too far from here. Milton Hershey of the Hershey Chocolate Fortune left his fortune as well as the Hershey companies right, for the benefit of what used to be, I mean, he wrote this in the will, white boys right, in this uh, orphan school. In the courts, they actually made it impossible for them, so it's no longer segregated, right? But the population of that school today is about 2,000, right? And it can't be much bigger than that because Hershey's not that big. The Hershey endowment today is $12 billion and growing. If you only spend 5% of that on the school and let the rest of the endowment keep growing ad infinitum, you'd have to spend $300,000 per student per year. And so it grows and keeps growing, and so on. Now, what's wrong with that? <laughs> what's bad about it? Well, if you think about it, <laughs> we're talking about a question of wealth inequality here, of a certain sort. Wealth inequality is increasing, not decreasing in our country. If we continue with this practice, right, the wealthy are earmarking ever larger amounts of the future economy to carry out their current wishes. What you end up with is a future economy that reflects the 1% of 100 years ago, not even those of the living then. The concern is that there's a deep injustice in disenfranchising the living by redistributing economic wealth, economic control to the dead, just like there would be if you transferred political rights to the dead. So I came out of this investigating this small corner of American life, estate planning, and I didn't like what I saw. 
I actually started really disliking the dead um, and the wishes of the dead. I don't think of myself as a prejudiced person, right? Uh, I'm not prejudiced against the dead. You know, some of my best friends are dead. Uh, and we're all going to eventually be dead. But what I discovered was that actually it's not the dead who are to blame for all of this. It's the living. Because the dead people aren't forcing us to do this. We, the living, keep carrying out their wishes and set up courts and laws to do it, right? And we do it from this uniquely American assumption that property rights are sacrosanct and eternal. But we can't keep having a country that has the courts enforce what the dead want. We can't have the courts enforce the connection to the living that we all want. But we should have that legacy because that's the right legacy to have and not because the courts need to enforce it because we want our legacy to be there. We shouldn't saddle future generations with a world where they have less and less control over their lives. We're in that world now, but we can change it.